भाई लाइफ क्या होगा So my name is Chiki Sarkar. I'm the publisher of Jagannath Books, and we're the very proud publishers of Twinkle Khanna. And I now been in publishing for almost 20 years, about 19 years. And Twinkle is the most unusual writer that I've ever worked with. So let me tell you why. Through the editing process of this book, these are the comments I used to hear. You're not being hard enough on me. Why are you being hard enough on me? I'm sure this isn't good enough. Why are you letting this go? Why is Jayashri just saying it's a fine copy edit? I'm sure there are more mistakes. No one beats themselves up. No one strives for perfection as much as Twinkle does. I've never had an author who, she's a best-selling author, she's India's top-selling email author. She should be sitting on her perch, feeling happy and smart in her talent and success. And yet every day she wants to do better and better and better. And when Twinkle first came into the limelight and started doing well, you know, people said the yeah. usual things, right? Oh, of course, she's Lakshya's wife, she's Dimple's daughter, this is why she's famous. But the real secret to her fame, apart from her extraordinary talent, is this. She never ever stays still. She never ever wants to be anything but the best. And if the world, if life is a mountain, then Twinkle keeps carrying peak, goes peak after peak, you know, she never stops it's like a flat anymore. And this book of hers is the best thing she's ever written. It's the truest, deepest, most moving, most subtle, most complex story that she's ever written. And one of the things we discovered when we were doing all the press for this book is that every journalist has come to Twinkle and they'd say, Oh, you know what? We relate to X or we relate to Y. Uh, Anshu, the, the lead character, is so real that when you guys all read the book, you find her in her, someone you know, and perhaps a little bit of yourselves. And she's created this magical character and this wonderful, totally involving, totally moving story. Um, and Twinkle will keep doing more and more of this. I mean, when you look at her career, I know, as I said to all the press, you know, she's the most interesting celebrity we have in this country. Just look at her journey. As she says herself, she was a sort of terrible, semi-failed actress, who for years <laughs> then was focused on running a family, uh, looking after her husband, running a small business. And then comes her 40s, she's asked to write a column, and she's never written before, and it's become an instant hit. And I remember at the time, uh, I hadn't heard much about her, I hadn't really seen her films. And I started reading her columns and I couldn't stop. And you know, there were millions of people like me. And what happens next, that's only the beginning. Times of India picks her up. And she's currently Times of India's top selling, uh, most read columnist. And I want to... India's most read English newspaper and in that newspaper she is their most read columnist which makes her India's highest read columnist in the English language. Okay, that is who she is. She, she's written three books. Her first two books were instant bestsellers. She's probably the highest selling woman writer in India today. And then this year, what does she do? And this is what I mean about the mountains of Twinkle's life, right? So she becomes India's most read columnist. She becomes India's top selling woman writer. Then she says, no, I'm going to also start producing films. She produces that brilliant film, Bad Man, which is done so fantastically by Isra. It's been a critical and commercial success. It's apparently one of the most watched films on Netflix. Uh, and you know, people say to me, what next with Twinkle? And I don't know because uh, all I know is that she'll you know, hit the ball out of the park again because she will never stay still. Uh, she will never rest on her laurels. And it's why I'm so proud of her. And it's why Jagannath is so proud to publish her. So this is what the, the so we're really thrilled to be here and to celebrate this book. And now I want to call the man of the hour, Karan Johar, who's going to be the MC of the evening. <laughs> Who's going to be in conversation with Twinkle and I also, we also have two very special guests, uh, Ranveer and Sonam, to do some readings for us so you get a flavor of this wonderful book. A little bit of housekeeping to the press. I know you're desperate to take great photos 
please stay where you are. There is going to be a proper photo opportunity at the end of the event and then you can come in front and do whatever you do. But for the moment, stay where you are. And for our guests, please put your phones on silent. Because you know what happens when Karan Johan and Twinkle get on stage. Uh, we see electricity, we see sizzling, and we see extraordinary stage magic. So you want no, no interruptions. Thank you. Karan, Twinkle, please come on stage. Hi, and good evening, and before I call Tina on stage, I thought that all the praise is now over and done with, and now it's time for me. Um, and thank you, Chiki. I know that you've heard that several times from Tina, that you know that you're not hard enough, and I'm waiting to hear that from someone very soon. Uh, that would be quite nice, actually, in my case. Uh, Tina, what do I say about you? Thank God you're not an actress. And you saved me so many, so many, so many times because of that. And by your own, admission, uh, your own admission, you didn't want to be an actor. And like she says to me, that she saved me. Uh, and that's why there's Rani Mukherjee in the film. Because you have to know that the very first film and the first narration I ever did for anyone on Kuch Kuch Hota was to Tina. That's why the character is called Tina. And of course, she heard the first half and got back to me and said she doesn't want to do it. I still actually called the character Tina and went ahead. Um, what began from then on was, was an interesting journey of two childhood friends. And I even went to boarding school because of my mother and her mother. And it was a torturous experience. And that is written in my book, so you must read it. That's not by this publishing house, but it's still a book that I wrote. Uh, uh, but it began a, a, a beautiful journey, as I said, of two childhood friends. And she really has, and I, and I say this, I've seen her through all shapes and sizes. And I'm not talking about her physically. I will not body shame. That's wrong. No one should body shame, and I can least support to. But shapes and sizes of her. Career. It's been a wondrous career. From the time, like Shiki said, she started writing columns to the time that she actually became a celebrated columnist Hello, and an author, best selling author. And she just told me how my book sold 30,000 copies and her sold 130,000 copies. I was shown my place. <laughs> I was shown my place right before I was here to praise her. Yes, I agree. You are a rock star, a bona fide genius, a talent that it has no bounds. Infinite talent, Tina. Glorious, glamorous, beautiful, and intelligent. You break the stereotype in every which way and the glass ceiling. And in this case, your pajamas are forgiving. I'm not sure, but your husband is definitely forgiving. Because I know what he has to put up with every time you come up with a column. There is always a prayer I think Akshay makes that save my house from being stoned because you never know what you're going to write. This book, I have to say, is an exceptional book. And I'm going to say this to her when we have the chat, of course, which will be in, in a few seconds. But it is an exceptional book. It has every beats that you can find out in a book that has character development, is saying something solid, it has the emotional journey, and it is hilarious. And I really want you all to discover Pajamas Are Forgiving when you do read it because it is an exceptional read. A read that I actually went through from evening to night. It was a fast read, exceptional, and I think it's the best book to date. And I really believe that she is really a force of nature and so before I say anymore, I'm going to call you on stage for our little teta -tete. Tina, stage is all yours. story is 20 years uh, old and in fact tomorrow Karan is directing me for the first time ever for an ad film and uh, God save your soul because I still can't act at all. <laughs> and did you discover? No, no, I've accounted for time on that. Okay. You should ask me some more time just because I know you're in the frame. But I'm actually directing, it's been 20 years since Kuch Kuch Hota, I never managed yes, to get remember it. remember last we directed our last act together and you have to do uh, good enough. Yeah, that, that was also told to me by the way. <laughs> No, no, that ad is amazing and you have to do better than that. <laughs> After she told me her, her book sold many more copies than mine. 100,000 100, more. Alright, so this is not about me, this is about you. And we're going to chat about this wonderful book. Firstly, and I think everybody in this room really wants to know why this title, Pajamas Are Forgiving. Well, two things. One, it fits the story because in that the protagonists are wearing pajamas throughout, right from the beginning to the end. The other one, because I think it's an allegory of life itself, where um, 
if you have pajamas and it's up to you to uh, you know find how tight to tie a drawstring or not. And I think by nature sometimes we're too forgiving our drawstring is too loose and uh, then we end up without any pants on. So that is the one thing. But the title came to me, it was, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, it was Diwali and after two weeks of drinking and eating and having lots of mithai, wearing Indian clothes, I was standing in my closet and trying on a pair of jeans and they did not fit. And the line popped into my head that salvars are forgiving in nature, it's jeans that really know how to hold a grudge. And then I waddled it off quickly and I wrote it down before I would forget. And it stayed with me and Wonderful title, it has amazing subtext and I read the book and it resonates right through the narrative. Now, before I opened the book, and of course I read the first couple of pages uh, before I did, and I read that you dedicated this book to your mom. Now, how come? Uh, now, I know we all dedicate things to our parents, but in this case, I know there is a reason. That's why I'm asking, because you know it's all about loving your parents. No, it's not about loving my parents, and in fact, uh, she's surprised I dedicated this book to her, because she never encouraged me in anything. She's always trying to pick faults. <laughs> Right in the beginning, when I first started writing poems, uh, one of my columns became very popular and I called her and I said, no, you know, my father was trying to read it. And she said, no, but I wanted to tell you over dinner last night that none of your serving dishes matched. So, I was so pissed off with her that I said, what's the use of having you as a mother? I wish Hema Malini was my mother. It's a kind of care for a pure heart. On a serious note, when I look back and everything that I write about, it seems to be about women finding the place in the world, about the chafing between what a woman is and what she's meant to be. And somewhere, where is my mother? Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't know this story, but I think somewhere, it's because I have this singular image in my head. When we were little and we moved to our grandmother's house, uh, we all had to share a room. So my mother and my aunt would share the bed, and my sister and me had mattresses on the floor. And every morning at five, my mom would wake up, she would put on this Jane Fonda tape, she'd put it on mute, and she would do her workout all around it. And then she would go to work, at that time they used to do three shifts. And she'd come home at nine, she never complained, she always had a smile. And for me, I think it was very clear at that point that a woman doesn't have to rely on anyone besides herself. And that men were okay, it was you know, enjoyable to have them, like a dessert, but they were certainly not the boss. And... Um, <laughs> well, we defer. <laughs> yeah, well, I think for you also they'll deserve definitely not to be the boss. <laughs> but um, having said that, I think uh, that pretty much defined my whole life because I have this unique vantage point looking up at this mattress and this creature in a pink leotard with matching sweatpants. And she set the bar so high that I've spent my whole life reaching for it. So that's why this book and everything as I've written should be dedicated to her. Well, there you manage that. With that moment, you emerged a great daughter. You've been a great wife that I've seen at close quarters myself, a great columnist, and now a great writer. And more than anything else, you're also a feminist icon. Now, how did that movement really shape itself? Can you rehearse these questions? No, I'm, anyway. no, I'm not. This is how I conduct my life. I ask people questions and I answer them. That's okay, pretty much what I do. You had a lot of practice. You must remember, I, I spent my life being an a, a question mark. All I want to be is an exclamation mark. That was a bad point, so. Okay, but say, I'm definitely a feminist, but I don't. But know an icon. Of that. But I, I mean, no, I find the word icon itself uh, slightly troublesome. I mean, look at it. Uh, if you say icon, it's basically I'm conning you, right? So anyone who's put on a pedestal is in a dangerous position because these are very narrow, elevated spaces. One little dance, one one drunken jig, and off you fall. So. I'm not any sort of icon, I'm just somebody who does my work and I walk quietly on the ground and feel firmly there. So you would say it's lonely at the top? 
No, because I'm not at the top. You're at the top, or are you at the bottom? I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> How is this becoming a lot When did this happen? Thank you. Just because your title has pajamas, it doesn't mean you take mine off. <laughs> I'm just saying, it just came to my head. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Lots of these thoughts only come to your head when I'm sitting next to you. I love you. Oh, okay, I love you too. Okay, now when I read the book, what struck me as a filmmaker is that this is tremendous, I, I really mean this, this is tremendous potential for digital material, for cinema material. It has amazing developmental character, it has a fast, speedy narrative, it also has an interval point. There is a juncture that has a midpoint and that's pretty much the prerequisite of mainstream cinema and therefore any kind of digital content. Now, was this ever a thought like other authors amongst you who actually write for film and and cinema, or this is something that you don't mind being an outsider. So can I let you know, and not, it's not really a secret, my bio in Times of India says that I'm trying to change my name to Chetali Bhagat so that all my columns become movies. <laughs> <laughs> so are you in two states of mind about that? <laughs> no, but um, I'm not in two states of mind at all. That was a good one. I, I don't really write for movies. Salam Oni Appa became a play and that just happened. When I wrote Murganandham's story, we were all very clear that this was something very urgent and it was something that really needed to be made, people had to see it and so Balki wrote that beautifully and made that movie. I don't think there's an end goal that everything has to happen and end up making uh, you know, cinema. I'm happy if it's just a book, people like it and that's it. And you're not in the number game, like you knew how many books you sold. Of course I'm in the number game. I have to be number one. And that is what, what I do. In, in the, because I had no chance of doing that in acting. So I was like number 101 and there were only 80 people. <laughs> so, so in this game, yeah, I do want to be number one. I also want to sell more than all the men. Because right now, all the highest sellers of men, we haven't been able to break that class ceiling. Then I'm going to break that. And do you get any kind of, and this is something I know because it's filmmakers, we get that level of anxiety when our product is out in terms of you're opening it up to opinion, in terms of critical opinion. Does that, do you get that kind of anxiety about what people are going to say about your work? No. I, uh, I'm not anxious about what people will say about my work. Uh, while coming here, I, I was talking to my daughter and I said, you know, today's a big day and my book is out and people are going to like it or they're not going to like it. She said, well, mom, what if they don't like it? I said, I've done my best. And that's really the fact. Like, I can't do anything beyond yes. that. But uh, after you finish writing a book, what I'd like to say is that people will think you're overjoyed, but actually you get depressed because uh, you have all these lovely <coughs> characters in your head and now you have nothing. So I could be having dinner with my ex, with my husband, but dreaming about having sex with my ex-husband in the book. Yeah. And that makes my life interesting and now I just have to have dinner with my husband with nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, any, any art form or creative space is vicarious living. Yeah. So that's what I think you've mastered, like all of us have. Yeah. We have a vicarious existence. Exactly. All the things we can't do, especially the things I know I can't do, I put it up on screen. And I think that's what you're doing through the development of your characters. Uh, not only that, but I'm a terrible eavesdropper. There, there are quite a few people here who say things. I quickly go, I write them down, they turn up in my books, I twist things around. And uh, I mean, Pinky once told me a joke. Uh, which she said, you know, I was going, and I have to repeat this, she said I was going for a surgery and, uh, you know, I told my husband that... Uh, she was going for a surgery. She was going for a surgery okay. and she told her husband that, uh, you know, in case I don't make it, just please make sure that all my diamonds and Gucci bags go to my daughter and not to your next wife. Yeah. So I went home and I quickly wrote that down <laughs> and put it into my book. So Pinky, I owe you for that life. <laughs> Alright, now, do you think I, you have... Also what I noticed when I read the book, that besides the character flow, the narrative, you're also saying things that are relevant to today. You're saying things, you're touching on topics that are being talked about, you're addressing it in your unique manner, as in the manner of humor, a manner of you know, being slightly candid in your approach. But you're definitely saying something. Do you want to share with the people before they read the book that you, what was your approach to that? I mean, whatever happens in the world does filter into your writing and that's how you interpret events. Yes. So I would say that the Me Too movement also has impacted all of us and it's not just women but it's men because it's made to examine your own ingrained behavior. 
yeah. and it found its yeah. way into my book as well. Yeah. Because what was not, interesting was I met a friend not in the, the city no, and, and he the told me something. He said I was seeing the, a girl and <laughs> we were talking and it was midnight and we spoke about everything, the you know tattoo on her thigh and the mole on her arm and then I went to kiss her and she said no. And I didn't know what to do at that point, that should I go ahead because if I do, I'm a sexual harasser and if I don't, I'm a loser. And I thought that was very interesting because he wasn't a creep and he was thinking about these things and that and those are the things that people never thought about maybe, you know, when we were young and all these men were just kind of jumping and trying to scratch you or something. <laughs> so I think that's really interesting and that kind of made its way into my work as well. So do you address the fine line between yes and no in the book in your own manner? I do because uh, I think there's a lot of ambiguity about consensual sex and yeah, I do address that. Okay, that's fascinating because I did find that. I just wanted to hear it from you since, since you created this world. And I felt very strongly that within all the humor and entertainment and beautiful writing, there lies very strong messaging. And I think any piece of great work, when it contributes to so society in a credible manner and lands up entertaining you, that to me is the main source of entertainment. Well, I think, Tina, everyone can't wait to read the book. It releases now nationwide, and of course, your claim will follow internationally and nationally, like Chiki has already said, all wonderful things about you, and so have we. I think we've raised you enough. But I think it's important, I think it's important for us to now hear messages. Now, we have two amazing personalities with us, um, amongst us, we had, you know, chosen and curated very beautifully by Tina to actually, um, actually do the reading of the passages. Um, I'm going to invite them on stage. I'm going to first invite, I think, a voracious reader, a fashionista, a terrific actor, national award-winning actor. Recently, and my bad woman. Re <laughs> recently married and, and created a huge storm in a coffee cup. I'm plugging my own show when I say that. She's gorgeous, she's amazing, and she's the perfect choice for someone to come on this platform and read passages of Tina's book, Pajamas Are Forgiving. I'm sure you've already given her the passages she's meant to read. And from what I know, you're about to get into a ride that you will not forget. Sonam Kapoor, the stage is all yours. Alright, uh, would you like to stand on the podium and read or sit and read whatever you choose? I think that's almost better, because then I can sit. All right, so Sona, before you start, would you like to say something about Tina before you start reading really immediately? Please, can you just read or say anything about no, me? Because I've said that thing. Yeah, please. No. <laughs> You're crazy. This is a puff piece platform. <laughs> I'm sitting in boots and I'm going to take those boots and eat you on the end of it. So I'm, I'm not the best orator, Karan. As you, as you know, I've uh, made many faux pas on your show itself. <laughs> Um, so I think I'll just go ahead and read somebody else's words. As an actor, that's my job, and I think right now I should do my job as right. well. <laughs> yeah, all right. um, so, Pajamas Are Forgiving. This is from page 69. <laughs> 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 The need to blink made my eyes water till finally I closed them. And when I opened my eyes again for the next round, I saw Jay was watching me, his gaze fixed, unwavering. The diffuse light stripped the years away from him. I could see the man from my youth sitting across another candlelit table, across time itself. The man who made me laugh as he inadvertently mispronounced Bidet, which became my pet name for him for a few years. Bibet, I used to call him, and he in turn called me Juju, an abbreviation for Jujube. I, I hope I pronounced that correct. Yeah. <laughs> a small fruit that tasted like a mix of apples and dates. I glanced back at the candle but couldn't stop my gaze from repeatedly sliding back to him. When Srinivasan finally switched the lights on and declared that the Tritaka class had come to an end, Jay ambled over to the window to get a glass of water from the earthen pot. He turned towards me and said, Anshu, wait, I want to talk to you for a second. Vivan and Jenna were waiting for me near the door, but I waved them onward and walked towards my ex-husband. I just want to say I'm sorry. She had no business making all those statements, even at the clinic. I, I really don't know what to say. It's all right, Jay. Everyone would have got to know sooner or later, I guess. I just, 
I just wish I had the opportunity of choosing when to tell them myself. I can only apologize on her behalf, I'm sure she's not easy to handle, but I'm going to talk to her. It's all right, I repeated, bending down to fill a glass from the dispenser. The water was warm, my hand unsteady as I gulped it down and a trickle splattered onto my kurta. I was raising my arm to wipe my mouth when he caught my hand. You still have this? A tiny circle of gold, a wreath wrapped around my finger. It was not my wedding band that I had started a long time ago. This was my first present from Jay. I looked up. I looked up at him, the memory intertwined in my mind with the lunch we had consumed that day, Chinese, at a hole in the wall called stomach. Jay had dropped toothpicks into the chicken chasman and then summoned the manager to get us lunch out of the house. We left the restaurant giggling, thrilled with our prank, promising to carry dead cockroaches and flies wrapped in tissue paper and stuffed into our pockets on our next date. We crossed the road and I looked into the store window behind me. Motiwala or Meenawala, the name of the store was the one thing I could not recall clearly and I saw the gold ring. He bought it for me. Do you remember, he said, his voice echoing in the empty yoga pavilion. Once in the middle of a fight, you threw it all over the wall of your house. After we made up, we jumped into your neighbor's garden, scrambling on our hands and knees, looking for it in the grass. He smiled, not letting go of my hand. We found it in some plant, right? Yes, it had fallen into a marigold pot. Almost two decades had passed, but I recall that evening distinctly. You took me for a long drive then, and when we returned, Mummy was waiting for us at the door in her favorite striped nightgown, the one that said, I love Mickey Mouse. You remember that? She screamed, you're a thief. And when I asked her, but what have I stolen, Mummy? She yelled back, you have stolen time. You had to come back at 11, now it's 12.30. This is robbery only of full one and a half hours. He laughed. He had an odd laugh, four precise beats, and then it was over, rehearsed, almost theatrical. He once told me that he used to stammer when he was very young, and he would constantly practice his speech, stretching out the vowels when he was in the bathroom. I could picture him, a young boy, standing in front of the mirror, rehearsing various words and probably this very laugh after brushing his teeth every night. My heart swelled for this little lost boy that I knew was still lurking there inside. I looked down at the ring, my hand still clasped within his, and I said, I'm used to it on my hand. Something's become a habit. We walked back together to the main building, ghosts in rustling white, walking in the darkness, unhurried, both making a tally of the things we had lost, things that would never be found at the bottom of, bottom of flower pots. Thank you so much for reading that wonderful passage out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sona. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, please, may I invite this bonafide force of nature who's won pajamas and come today. And, and to do the honors, I don't need to introduce him, he's come already on stage. Already. <laughs> Later. This is wearing pajamas. I produced 10,000 extra books. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Actually, thank you. You are beautiful, intelligent, talented, eloquent, elegant. Thank you, Bolo. Thank you. I told him once, say all these nice things to me in front of my husband, my stock will go up, and so thank you very much. Thank you. I'm right now the dollar okay. and not the rupee. Yep. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> I'm honored that you selected me. You chose me to read your passages. <laughs> Especially since I don't read books. I don't read books. The last book I read was Naughty. <laughs> but I did study English medium, ICSC, so here goes. I think before I start, a thundering round of applause for the verdict, guys. Dessert as you want, mister. <laughs> Why has this become about me? Why can you have pajamas and read? Now? Do you tuck together? I'll be your Ras Malai. <laughs> okay, okay. Control yourself. Huh? <clears throat> the 
consulting room had not changed in all the years I had been coming here. It was an impish childhood that held out against the grave endeavor of poring over 5,000 year old Vedic texts. My shoulder is better, Dr. Menon, but the sleep issues have gotten worse. I drift off the moment my head touches the pillow, but two hours later my leg jerks me awake. And it's as if my brain is giving the whole body a kick that seems to say, wake up. So now I spend night after night asking myself, wake up and do what? And I still don't have an answer. Dr. Menon loomed over me as I lay on the examination bed. Eyes closed, he checked my pulse. His fingers hovering over my wrists, my neck, even my navel was not spared. And then in his quiet, unapologetic manner, which usually held a hint of amusement, he declared, Anshu, what have you been ingesting? You always come back with a grievous vata imbalance. Chinese food or too much wine again? Walking back towards his desk, he continued, Parasomnia is what Western medicine calls this disorder. But I am telling you, it is because the air element is running through your body helter-skelter. It is vata that is responsible for all your problems. I have told you this right from the first time you came for treatment. I first came to Shantha Maya 13 years ago with Usha Bua, my favorite aunt and the last link to my father. I could always see bits of him in her, in the rounded shape of her eyebrows, the way she flapped her hands when excited, and even in her minuscule earlobes that barely had space to hold an earring, let alone the multiple piercings she sported, tiny diamonds that caught the eye as she moved her head. I had been in constant pain from two herniated discs in my neck after a nasty fall off a ladder of all things. So when Usha Bua decided to undertake this Ayurvedic pilgrimage for her rheumatoid arthritis, I accompanied her as well. That first trip, with its curative, rejuvenating outcome, meant that soon a visit to Shantamaya became a biennial event. My memory though of the decade-old lecture that Dr. Menon was referring to was hazy. But what I did recall clearly was sitting in this room after I had finished my first tenure. I was scheduled to go back home in two days' time and Dr. Menon had handed me a printed sheet. Please. No non-veg and alcohol for two weeks after this Panchkarma treatment. Thinking of the adjustments I would have to make at home brought another question to my mind. I hesitated at first, but then asked, Doctor, but uh, what about, you know, physical relations? Anshu, that also entails two weeks of waiting, or all the benefits of this treatment are lost. But Doctor, I will. Why didn't you tell me? What if I had not asked you, my whole treatment would have gone down the drain? To which he replied, see the instruction sheet, point number 6 says, no vigorous physical activity. That's hardly self-explanatory, Dr. Menon. And it's not always that vigorous, you know. Sometimes you just lie down flat on your back and think of George Clooney. <laughs> Dr. Menon's expression, his eyebrows reaching high enough to salute his receding hairline was clearly etched in my memory. Trying to redeem myself, I had ended up falling deeper into the pit with, uh, you can also think of patriotic things like your country or the Prime Minister. A horrified pause on both ends and I squealed. No, no, I didn't mean the Prime Minister, just a slip of the tongue, Dr. Menon, that Manmohan Singh looming between your legs wouldn't work as a fantasy. <laughs> I would be country, like, you know that famous saying, like, I can think of England. Come to think of it, we as a nation did exactly that for more than a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> and I came to an uneasy halt with this nervous giggle. That evening, Dr. Menon stopped me near the lotus pond and handed me another printed sheet. This time assigning a new treatment which involved sitting for 40 minutes with a funnel made of dough on my head that was slowly filled with hot oil. Below the appointment time in bold letters it said, Shirovasti, treatment good for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and mental, mental imbalances. I clambered off the examination bed. Yes, yes, of course I remember, doctor. I said hastily before he decided to write down another toe curling treatment for my memory loss. Thank you. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you. 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 Thank these passages are grand reflections of how amazing the book is. It's also a hoot, like we have just seen. And there are some risque elements uh, that have crept into the narrative as well. And uh, I wish you luck. Uh, <laughs> uh, because I have a tendency of inviting trouble, and so do you. So do you. So Tina, last thoughts on this, on this lovely day that we're having, and this lovely launch that we're having.
Well, I just uh, want to say a word of thanks. I'd like to thank all my friends, my family for being here, for all the love, for all the support. I've already said, forgive me for eavesdropping on your writing things that you'll say when you're sober, especially when you're drunk. I'd like to thank my husband. Uh, not only is he very easy on the eyes, but it's his easygoing nature that I truly cherish. <laughs> My mother, superheroes don't need a cake. Your pink Leoja did the job perfectly well. Thank you. And uh, Sarita Tanwar, where are you? Put your hand up. Where are you? Give us a wave. So Sarita asked me to write my first column. She let this cow out and now there's Dhamutra everywhere. It's all her fault. I'd like to thank my friend and my editor, Chiki Sarkar. We are a very productive pair. Every two years, I produce a book and she produces a baby. <laughs> and uh, during the making of this book, we've had bitter fights. She's taken all my metaphors, aphorisms, my right kidney and thrown it out of the window. She cut 11,000 of my words, which really hurts, but I had to tell she, she was right. She did what your husband could manage <laughs> yeah. over years. <laughs> well done. You should have married her. <laughs> Um, well, I guess 2019, I don't know about Modi Sarkar, but I'm definitely going to say Abki Bhar Bhi Chiki Sarkar. Yeah. So can the fabulous Chiki Sarkar please come up Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, we would love to invite the two wondrous like to thank The Pajama Man, thank you very much for the lovely read and solo, my darling. Thank you very much. You really made this evening very special. Could you two please come up on stage? And I can see Bobby looking at me and laughing. I mean, we fought our whole lives, and now he's here looking at my book launch. Well, finally, I did something right. So please buy generously, buy a copy for yourself, buy a copy for your friends. It's a wonderful book. You read it in a sitting and you won't be able to forget it. Thank you so much. And thank you ladies and gentlemen. That was that.